welcome you to this beautiful Easter Tree Doom Reflections. Before we start, let's invite the Holy Spirit. Let's close our eyes. We pray together. You can repeat after me. O oh my Jesus, direct my mind. O oh my Jesus, possess my being. O oh my Jesus, envelope me in the depths of your heart. O oh my Jesus, defend me from the assaults of the enemy. O oh my Jesus, my only hope is in you. O oh my Jesus, speak to my heart, that every word that I hear will be you speaking to me, that my heart be open to receive your word. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. I first invited you to close your eyes and pray. Now I'm going to invite you to close your eyes and do something a little bit mischievous. So I invite you, close your eyes. And now picture this beautiful chocolate cake. And on top of this chocolate cake, there is a rich, creamy layer of icing. Delicious. And then on top of that, there is a cherry. Lovely, juicy. You can open your eyes now. Well, I know I'm not supposed to tempt you when most of you are fasting and most of us are entering this time uh, of of Lent and the pinnacle of that, which is the Easter tree doom. But in some ways, this chocolate cake represents the whole year, the whole liturgical year. And this beautiful cream top represents the season of Lent. And then that cherry on the top of the icing of the cake is the Holy Week. And within that, the pinnacle is the Easter tree doom. And so as we come today on Monday, Thursday to reflect on the beautiful feast that we celebrate today, the institution of the Eucharist, the institution of the priesthood, a new commandment that Jesus gives us. It's a wonderful day in the church history. It's a wonderful day in the liturgical year. But above all, it's a wonderful day for your and my transformation. Because finally, all of it leads to us becoming more like Jesus. And so today, Mother Church gives us a beautiful opportunity to reflect and to see how am I called to become more like Jesus. 
And therefore, when we started, we talked about chocolate cake and food and you'll say, but why food when we are all supposed to fast? And right, you should. But again, food is something that Jesus used right through his ministry. And it culminates today in this feast that we celebrate of the institution in the Eucharist. So let's go back and look at the various types of food that Jesus talked about. And Jesus, in a way, introduced his first miracle, as John calls it, the first sign. That's quite interesting. The other synoptic uh, evangelists, the Gospels, call it miracles. And they talk about the various miracles Jesus did. And John doesn't use the word miracle. John uses the word sign. As sign as in something pointing. And for John, the miracle is not an end in itself, but it is to point to the divinity of Jesus, to point to who Jesus is, to point to something even deeper. And so in that first miracle, John introduces Mary and Jesus. Do whatever he tells you. Mary tells the disciples. And then Jesus turns water into wine. That beautiful first sign is a symbol of the new Eve going to the new Adam, that union of the new Eve and the new Adam giving us the rich wine, prefiguring all the many graces that come from the Eucharist. And so the wine is something that is very rich. And as we see today, that is symbolizing the rich love, the grace, the bounty that God gives us in Christ. And then in John chapter 6, John introduces us to that beautiful expanse of bread. Right from the multiplication of bread, which again is tremendously symbolic, where we see those four elements, took, blessed, broke, and gave. He took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it. It happened on the mountaintop where there were 4,000 and 7,000 and all the thousands of people who were on the top where Jesus multiplied bread. And yet, John tells us those beautiful pattern, took, blessed, broke, and gave. The same pattern that we will see at the very Eucharist institution. Later on, when we go to the Eucharistic celebration or the readings of Monday, Thursday, you will see those beautifully being portrayed. So let us take that John chapter 6 passage. And as we look at the bread episode, it is then moving into the bread of life discourses where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood, my flesh, six times in John chapter 6, we hear the word my flesh, my flesh, my flesh, my flesh. It's like Jesus is insisting, please do not take this symbolically. And yet today, so many of us, so many of us young people, so many of our seniors as well, I remember in my confirmation class once asking my students, is the Eucharist symbolic or is the Eucharist really Jesus? And many of them said symbolic. Uh, and, it, and it pains me because we've in some ways missed the whole essence if we think that the Eucharist is symbolic because Jesus chose very specific words. And there are, in the English, we hear that word, eat, eat, and we think it's just one word. But in John, when you look at the original Greek, there are two words. There's estheo and there's trogio. Estheo is where you have fine dining, where you eat with cutlery and you can really have a nice meal. And he starts by that, where he says, if you eat my flesh, and then they were disturbed. And so he moved to the other word, trogio, which is to chew, to gnaw, like you would do with a piece of tandoori chicken or a leg or tangri kebab. And he's saying, eat my flesh, chew on it, eat it like you would, like a dog would gnaw at a piece of flesh. Because he's insisting that that is his flesh. And people walked away, scandalized, saying, this is too hard, too hard. And Jesus said, hey, come back, come back. It's only symbolic. No, he didn't. If it was, he may have called them back. But he was insistent that this is my flesh. And he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood will live forever. I am the living bread which comes down from heaven. And so those reflections, those readings of John 6 is something that we cannot just gloss over. It is important for you and I to spend a few moments 
to allow ourselves to remind ourselves how many times have I been to the Eucharist? How many times have I walked up the aisle to receive the body of Christ? And yet my mind has been so distracted. I have been thinking about maybe the problems at work, the problems in my family, or thinking about how poorly the choir is singing, or how that lady is dressed in front, or my mind is completely distracted. But I am going to receive the flesh of Jesus. If only I understood that, then every walk, the church in fact calls it a procession. Every procession in the church in the liturgy is symbolic. An entrance procession is a procession towards the house of God. An offertory procession is processing to offer ourselves. A communion procession is reminding us. All processions remind us that we are a pilgrim people, that we are always on a journey and our destination is heaven. Our destination is Christ. Our destination is to become like Christ. And therefore, when we receive his flesh, he comes into us, communion, one with us. And therefore, the beautiful richness of every Eucharist that we go to, the Lord is inviting you and I right now to close our eyes and to think about every time I have received the Eucharist. What has been my attitude? What has been my disposition? Paul says, in the reading that you will hear of Monday, Thursday, if we eat his flesh and drink his blood without examining, without discerning our conscience, discerning what we are doing, we could bring judgment upon ourselves. But we like to gloss over that because it's hard. And yet you and I are called to come before the Lord to prepare our hearts. And so let us spend a minute in silence, bringing to mind the times that we have received the Eucharist in an unworthy manner. Many times, many times, we've been late for Mass. We've been distracted. And the Lord is here to forgive us. Make a resolution that the next time I go to the Eucharist, I will truly experience his flesh entering mine, his body, his blood, communing with mine. Let's take the next element, which is the wine. And again, so beautifully we see in the Gospels, and it's a tricky one here, because if you really read carefully, you'll see Matthew and Mark talk about the bread and the cup. And if you see Luke, there are actually two cups that are there. And it's quite confusing. And you may wonder, if you've paid attention before, you may wonder, why are there two cups? Because in Luke, if you read in Luke 22, verse 14 onwards, it said, when the hour came, he took his place at the table. And the apostles with him, he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. So cup, bread, cup. How many of you have noticed this before? We are so used to every day at Mass, there's the bread and there's the cup. And you're not wrong. Because Matthew and Mark have that order. But Luke has a cup, bread and cup, which immediately makes us think, what is actually happening? And if you were a Jew in the first century, this would have been absolutely commonplace for what's happening. Why are there two cups? In fact, 
any Jew would know that there were four cups. At that time, every Passover celebration had four cups. The names of those are a bit complicated, but it's worth knowing them because it's, it's interesting to know. The first cup, which is known as the Kiddush cup, it is the introductory or the sanctifying cup. It is the first and at the start of the Passover meal, which is also known as the Seder or Seder. The second cup, which is the Haggadah cup. This is the cup of proclamation. It tells the story of what God did for Israel. The third cup is the Beracha cup. This cup follows the grace after meals. And it's a blessing, a cup of communion, a cup of praise. And finally, it is the Hallel cup or the fourth cup, which is the great praise, the grand Hallel and uh, the dispersion. Does this ring a bell? Introductory and sanctification, proclamation, communion, and then the great Hallel and dismissal. You're right. Every Mass has these parts where you come with the introductory and the sanctification, where we take the holy water, we anoint ourselves, we say, Lord of mercy, Christ of mercy, Lord of mercy, we sanctify ourselves. Then there is the great proclamation, which have the readings, and then there is the offertory and the consecration, which is the cup of blessing which we raise, which is the psalm that is often taken during Monday Thursday. And finally, the great Hallel, which is communion with God, which is communion with His people and going out uh, to his God in His people. And so, if you were a Jew and you were reading Matthew who was written to you, you already know when, they, when Matthew writes, and Matthew's writing is very interesting. Matthew chapter 26, verse 26 says, While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, and then the cup. While they were eating. And we would not even think twice. Uh, we would continue reading. But a Jew, when he saw those words, while they were eating, instinctively knew two cups are over. Because they did not eat when the first cup was being drunk. The first cup was the introductory cup. The first cup was the sanctifying cup. And so the meal began with the first cup. While they were eating is when the second cup comes into play. While they were eating, the youngest had to ask the oldest, what is this celebration all about? And then the tradition says that the oldest would talk about the Passover and how God brought his people out of Egypt and how through his mighty hand and his strong arm, Moses, through his servant Moses, God was able to deliver his people. And he would take them through the account of the Passover, of the lamb that had to be slain, of the blood that had to be put on the doorposts, of the bitter herbs that had to be eaten, the flesh of the lamb that had to be eaten, and how they ran in haste. So all of this was explained, and how Pharaoh chased them through the Red Sea, and how uh, Pharaoh and his horses uh, were caught there, and how God took his people onto dry ground safely. All of this happening during the second cup. And then they would take the third cup, which is the cup of blessing. So Luke gives us two and three, cups number two and cup number three. Matthew and Mark give us cup number three. While they were eating, Jesus took the cup. And it's very beautiful because he is really enacting that beautiful Passover. And without the Passover, which prefigured the Easter Triduum that we are celebrating, the Jews did not experience God's hand and you and I, which that event pointed to, are now able to enjoy the fruit of the true Paschal mystery. Peshak or Pascha, these are all words for passing over from death to life, from slavery to freedom from doubt and, and distress to faith and joy. And these are gifts of the Easter uh, people that we have. And therefore, the great Hallel is our song. And so you're getting a clue into these beautiful four cups and how the Lord is giving us uh, an insight into the richness of the Eucharist. So let's look at it a little more. So in the first cup, as they drink it, they are sanctifying themselves, introducing themselves. In the second cup, the youngest asks the head of the family, what are we doing this for? Why are we doing this? 
And very strangely, in the Gospels, the youngest asked the head a question. If you remember, they pointed to John and said, Ask the master, who is it who is going to betray you? And John, who was leaning on the breast of his master, asked a question. And so it's so uh, the prefiguration of the asking of the question by the youngest to the head. Jesus was the head of that household in a sense of his apostles. And he asked that question. And so while they were eating, Jesus took the bread and he offered it. And he said, this is my body. And then he came to the third cup. Now, this is in some ways is like the main course in the meals. You have different things to eat. You had the bitter herbs. You had all of that being done. And Jesus says, this is the cup of blessing. He took it, blessed it and gave it to them. The cup of blessing or the Beracha cup. And when he finished, and again it's quite interesting. When they had sung the hymns, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Sacrilege! Sacrilege! If you were a Jew at that moment, it would be sacrilege. How can you leave the meal incomplete? How can you finish only three cups and go before the fourth cup? That was not the Passover meal. And yet Jesus says, I will not drink again until I have drunk the same anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Verse 29. So what's happening here? What is Matthew trying to tell us? Exactly what Jesus did. He stopped halfway. And when they had sung the hymn, they went out through the Mount of Olives. Three-fourth way, not necessarily half. Three out of four cups are done. Imagine when they had sung a hymn. Have you ever pictured Jesus singing? We've heard of Jesus walking and Jesus talking and Jesus healing. Jesus singing. Quite interesting. Sometimes in your personal prayer, it'll be nice if you can close your eyes and imagine Jesus singing. Maybe a rich baritone, maybe a high tenor, maybe a deep bass voice would be good. We're so caught up in our own traditional ways of prayer. We don't allow the Holy Spirit. Try it out once. Mental prayer, picturing, imaging. St. Ignatius of Loyola encouraged his sons to use this prayer form of mental prayer, of imagination, praying with the mind, praying with the imagination. And so picture Jesus singing that Hallel as he's going to the Mount of Olives. Again, very strange. Mount of Olives, Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane, press of oil. Where the oil was being crushed, the olives were being crushed to get oil, was the meaning of Gethsemane. Olives, where the olive trees were in a garden. We talked about the first sign being Mary, the new Eve, and Jesus, the new Adam. And now we go to another garden of Gethsemane. And then Jesus will go to another garden of Calvary. And so th the Holy Spirit is situating us back in the garden where it all began. Back in a garden where the disobedience of man led to his fall. Back into a garden. And we are going to see tomorrow how that fourth cup will be drunk. Is that the fourth cup that's going to be drunk when Jesus is praying in Gethsemane? Is that the fourth cup that will be drunk when they put a hyssop to his mouth? Let us see tomorrow. But there is only one thing that I want to leave you with today. That the fourth cup is the climax of the meal. And then the words that were said by the eldest who finished that fourth cup at the Passover meal was Tel Telesti which means it is finished. I'm sure you'll recognize those words, but we will see them tomorrow. For now, let us come back and situate ourselves. Close your eyes and situate yourself in that upper room where Jesus is looking at his disciples. And then he bows down takes off his outer garment, wraps an apron around his waist and bends down exactly where you are sitting. And he picks up your foot, grimy, dirty, sweaty. 
you were not prepared for this moment. And he washes it. And as that cool water is flowing over it, the Holy Spirit's reminding you of your baptism. The choice that Jesus made for you, even before you were put in a position to make a choice for him. And he is wiping it, wiping away every sin, wiping away every fault, wiping away every brokenness. And then he kisses it. And he looks around and says, one of you will betray me. And everyone is saying, is it I, Lord? But your eyes do not meet his. And you promise. Lord, help me never to betray you. Help me never to let you down. I am weak, Lord. But your grace is sufficient for me. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. the name.